In this video, we'll look at the main types of hearing loss, the main causes of hearing loss, and how to distinguish between them. The first step to understanding hearing loss is understanding the different parts of the ear. So starting with the outer ear, we have the auricle or pinna, which is the visible part of the ear that is outside the head. There is also the external acoustic meatus, otherwise known as the ear canal, which runs from the outer ear to the middle ear. The tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, is what physically separates the outer ear from the middle ear. This membrane transmits sound from the air to the ossicles, which is a set of three tiny bones called the malleus, incus and stapes, also known as the hammer, anvil and stirrup. Finally, these ossicles will amplify and transmit the sound vibrations to the cochlea of the inner ear, which contains the organ of corti, the sensory organ for sound. Within the organ of corti, there are hair cells, which serve as the sensory receptors and transform the sound vibrations into electrical impulses. These electrical impulses from the auditory system will be transmitted along the cochlear nerve, while balance information from the vestibular apparatus is carried by the vestibular nerve. These two nerves join together to form the vestibular cochlear nerve, otherwise known as the eighth cranial nerve, which then brings the information to the brain. And this diagram summarizes the normal hearing pathway through all of these structures. Sounds are collected by the outer ear, and these waves travel through the air in the ear canal before making the eardrum vibrate. These vibrations are transmitted and amplified by the tiny oscal bones. And finally, the hair cells in the cochlea convert these vibrations into electrical impulses, which are transmitted to the brain via the cochlea and vestibular cochlear nerves. Now this pathway can be affected at different stages, which is what leads to hearing loss. If the final stage involving the cochlea and the nervous system is affected, we use the term sensory neural hearing loss. If any of the other stages before this are affected, we call it conductive hearing loss. And we can formally define sensory neural hearing loss as an issue involving the sensory structures in the inner ear or the nervous system. On the other hand, conductive hearing loss is when the sound waves are unable to actually reach the sensory structures in the inner ear because the conduction pathway is affected. Now we'll look at the main causes of hearing loss and why they fall under each category. Some of the causes of conductive hearing loss are obvious. The technical term for earwax is cerumen and it can become impacted in the ear canal, obstructing the passage of sound. The eardrum can become perforated, most commonly due to trauma, barotrauma or infection, and this will prevent sound from being transmitted to the middle ear effectively. Otitis means ear inflammation, and the two main types are externa and media. Otitis externa involves inflammation of the ear canal, which may be due to a bacterial infection or due to allergies and even autoimmune disorders in chronic cases. The inflammation can then result in swelling and discharge, which can become severe enough to block the ear canal. Otitis media is inflammation of the middle ear, where the discharge can again be enough to cause conductive hearing loss. And one particular form of otitis media, called chronic suppurative otitis media, is actually a cause of tympanic membrane perforation. Otosclerosis is a rarer condition, although it's thought to be the cause of Beethoven's hearing loss. This condition affects the conduction pathway at the level of the ossicles, because the disease involves the development of bone tissue around the stapes, or stirrup, which makes it hardened and unable to move properly. This stops the ossicles from amplifying and transmitting sound vibrations to the cochlea effectively. Diagnosis is based on the clinical picture of conductive hearing loss, but unlike the otitis conditions, there won't be any signs of infection and the tympanic membrane will appear normal. Nowadays, otosclerosis can be treated by surgically removing the stapes and replacing it with a metal or plastic prosthetic implant. Another rare but important cause of hearing loss is cholesteatoma. This is a growth of skin cells in the middle ear, which is usually acquired from repeated infections but it can be congenital in some cases. Although these growths are considered benign, 
they are erosive with the potential to grow significantly and destroy the ossicles, resulting in conductive hearing loss. They can also become infected and present with lots of discharge, creating some clinical overlap with otitis. And therefore it's important to remember cholesteatoma as a differential until it's definitively ruled out. Treatment involves surgically removing the cholesteatoma whilst trying to preserve function. If the growth has affected the ossicles, there may be no option but to remove the ossicles as well, which will affect hearing. Reconstruction of the middle ear may then be attempted, but it's not always successful. The causes of sensory neural hearing loss include a range of pathologies affecting the inner ear as well as the brain. Firstly, presbycusis is the technical term for age-related degeneration of hair cells, the sensory receptors of the auditory system that are found in the cochlea. Central causes of sensory neural hearing loss include meningitis, which is why a hearing screen is usually part of the follow-up process, especially in children. A range of brain tumours may affect the CNS as well, but a specific example to be aware of is acoustic neuroma, otherwise known as vestibular schwannoma. These are benign tumours that develop on the vestibular cochlear nerve after arising from the Schwann cells, which are normally responsible for producing the myelin sheath. Since this nerve carries hearing and balance information, the symptoms will include hearing loss as well as vertigo in the affected ear. Labyrinthitis is another disease which causes hearing loss and vertigo, and this is a self-limiting inflammatory condition which is most commonly caused by a viral infection, and it affects the entire maze of fluid-filled channels in the inner ear. This includes the cochlea and the vestibular apparatus, so that's why there's a combination of hearing loss and imbalance. A similar condition that's often confused with labyrinthitis is vestibular neuritis, but the inflammation there is limited to the vestibular nerve, so hearing should not be affected. Menia's disease is a rare but important cause of sensory neural hearing loss, which is caused by the excessive buildup of a fluid called endolymph in the inner ear. This then interferes with the sensory cells of both the vestibular and auditory systems, resulting in the classic triad of hearing loss, tinnitus and vertigo. And finally, it's important to remember that some medications can cause sensory neural hearing loss by damaging structures in the inner ear. These medications include aminoglycoside antibiotics like gentamicin, NSAIDs, diuretics and chemotherapy agents such as cisplatin. Now let's look at how we can investigate hearing loss. As always, it's helpful to take a bedside, blood and imaging or special tests approach. By the bedside, you can look in the ear with an otoscope to examine the canal for earwax buildup and signs of discharge, as well as look at the tympanic membrane for any evidence of perforation. You can also do Rinne's and Weber's tests by the bedside to identify the type of hearing loss. Blood tests aren't always indicated, although checking the inflammatory markers might be useful when infective causes are suspected. An MRI scan will often be needed to rule out sinister causes of hearing loss, such as tumours. An audiometry is a special test which assesses the patient's ability to hear different volumes and pitches. Rennes and Weber's tests and audiometry will be the most useful for distinguishing between conductive and sensory neural hearing loss, and we'll now look at these in more detail. But before we look at these investigations, the final key concept to understand is the difference between air conduction and bone conduction. Air conduction means the conduction pathway that we've looked at so far, which is how we normally hear things. Sound from the air traveling through the different conducting structures inside the ear to reach the cochlea. For air conduction to work, all the different parts of the hearing pathway need to be working. Bone conduction is an alternative route in which sound is conducted to the inner ear via the bones of the skull, which means it bypasses the ear canal and other conducting structures inside the ear. This means that hearing via bone conduction only requires the inner ear structures and nervous system to be working. And therefore, we can now say that sensory neural hearing loss will impair hearing via both the air conduction and bone conduction pathways because the sensory receptors and nervous system 
are involved in both pathways. Meanwhile, conductive hearing loss will only affect hearing via the air conduction pathway because the bone conduction pathway will bypass any of these pathologies. Now let's use this theory to interpret the investigations. In Rinne's test, you apply a vibrating tuning fork to the patient's mastoid bone and ask them to tell you when they can no longer hear the sound. Then you remove the fork from the bone, hold it one or two centimeters from the ear canal and ask them if they can still hear the sound. In a healthy person, the inner ear is more sensitive to sound via air conduction than bone conduction. So they should continue to hear the sound when the fork is removed from the bone. This is a normal result, although it's confusingly called a positive Rinne's test. A negative Rinne's test, where bone conduction is better than air conduction, would suggest conductive hearing loss in the affected ear, because there's clearly an issue with the air conduction pathway. But you can have false negative results, which is why we also perform Weber's test to confirm the issue. Weber's test involves applying the tuning fork to the forehead and seeing whether the sound is heard equally or if it lateralizes to an ear. If the sound lateralizes to an ear, that does not necessarily mean it's the good ear, which is why the results have to be interpreted in the context of Rinne's test. In conductive hearing loss, there is actually a relative improvement in bone conduction on the affected side, which means that the sound from Weber's test would be heard louder in the bad ear. In summary, a positive normal Rinne's test, where air conduction is better than bone conduction, could mean that the ear is healthy or that there is sensory neural hearing loss, in which case Weber's test will lateralize to the healthy ear. On the other hand, a negative abnormal Rinne's test, where air conduction is worse than bone conduction, would suggest a conductive hearing loss, which is confirmed by Weber's test lateralizing to the affected ear due to the relative improvement in bone conduction. Audiometry is a special test, which also assesses air and bone conduction, but the information is represented graphically. The patient wears a device consisting of headphones to test air conduction, along with a bone oscillator to test bone conduction. And they are asked to respond to sound at different pitches and volumes, which usually involves pressing a button when they can hear the sound. The x-axis represents the sound frequency or pitch, and the y-axis represents the volume. The lowest volume that they can hear for each frequency is plotted, and different symbols and connecting lines are used for air conduction and bone conduction. This audiogram represents normal hearing, where the air and bone conduction lines are similar and both within the normal range of minus 10 to plus 20 decibels. In sensory neural hearing loss, the two lines will be similar again, but they will both be below the normal range, because as we saw earlier, sensory neural hearing loss affects both the air and bone conduction pathways. On the other hand, we know that conductive hearing loss selectively affects air conduction, while the bone conduction pathway remains intact. And this creates an air bone gap on the audiogram, where the air conduction line is significantly below the bone conduction line. As well as distinguishing between the two types of hearing loss, audiograms can also give some clues about the specific cause. For example, Sensory neural hearing loss, which is worse at higher frequency sounds, is suggestive of presbycusis, the age-related impairment. Whereas Menier's disease is characterised by low frequency sensory neural hearing loss. However, the overall clinical picture does need to be considered when interpreting these findings.